Uh, without further ado, I'm going to announce our second Saturday speaker. This is Mike Snyder of the Antique Toy and Fire Truck Museum. All right. Well, thank you for that um, introduction, and thank you for your interest and participation in today's conversation. I, is it going to be okay if I hold the mic and just move a little bit, or you want me to stick? Okay, I, I promise, as, as we work through there. So because of the small group and the small crowd that we have today, as we go through, if there's an area that you want to explore a little bit um, further, just raise your hand and we'll try to have some questions and discussion. I have a point of that in the back as far as my agenda. Um, and, and obviously, as we, we look at really the colorful fire history in Bay County, uh, there are literally hundreds of different stories that I could tell. And I've really picked three out of the book uh, to really kind of maybe tantalize your interest. Uh, maybe we'll sometime in the future want to take a look at a, a few others. And so as I'll start to talk in just a minute, um, we're going to try to level set a bit about where Bay City was in 1880 um, and how that really impacted fire protection and the challenges that, that we had with fire protection. And then the three stories that I'd like to, to really talk about moving then from 1880 all the way really to the present time would be to really talk about the grandfather of the Bay City Fire Department who really kind of got the first fully organized and functional uh, fire department operation going, and that's Thomas Harding, and he was fire chief from 1883 uh, until 1912 when he died. Um, and we'll really talk about this colorful character and uh, many of the things that he did uh, to both promote Bay City as well as the Bay City Fire Department. Um, and we'll, we'll just kind of go through a little bit of history there. Then we're going to move forward to the 1940s um, and talk about Paul Glockstein. And Paul was an automotive dealer who also happened to pick up um, the W.S. Darley Fire Equipment Distributorship for mid-Michigan. And those two areas of interest kind of collided in a very constructive way when neighboring townships outside of Bay City uh, wanted to have organized fire protection. And so Mr. Glockstein organized a contract fire department that served Bangor, Hampton, and Portsmouth townships from the mid-1940s through 1947, uh, when the, those departments really picked up organized departments of their own. And really kind of wetting his whistle then in that fire protection service, he ended up picking up a Willys distributorship, so think of Willys Jeeps, and took W.S. Darley parts and pumps, putting them onto Willys Jeeps and became a well-respected fire truck manufacturer that was located where Gopher Turf and Till used to be on Tuscola Road here in Bay City. And um, he uh, produced some very interesting fire trucks. We'll show you some of those, uh, several which still survive into this day. Uh, and that's one that you know we are very interested in the museum to get our hands on one that we can work on on restoring, and then we'll finish with um, you know kind of a, I'll call it my anchor leg here is uh, Bay City Fire Station number three, um, that was a um, Platt and Cope uh, designed architected. Uh, uh, fire station st went into service in 1890 until 1917. Uh, the fire museum acquired this in 2019, and we finished the architecture and engineering, and now we're working on initial funding so that we can start to restore it and move a significant portion of our collection to a year-round facility uh, for both events, planning, and also for um, uh, displaying key parts of the fire history uh, and emergency services collection. And we'll finish with questions and answers, but like I said, be more than glad to kind of work uh, through that in um, a greater bit of detail. So my first story is, um, you know, as we try to work on level setting this, um, really want to make sure that there's kind of an understanding of where we were in 1880, right? We were a, a young city at that time. And we were really, you know, from a, a fire service standpoint, we were two cities. We were Bay City and West Bay City, each having their own professional fire department. Um, and what will be interesting, right, if we'll talk just very briefly about the fire of 1892 that wiped out about 30 blocks in the south end of Bay City, the only four fire departments that had equipment and manpower that responded to that were Bay City, West Bay City, excuse me, Saginaw, and Flint. So that was kind of the universe of organized fire service at the time. Um, and, you know, as, as you really kind of think about that, and I'm just, you know, kind of looking here, um, the early part of the history 
of Bay City and its fire departments is the first efforts to organize structured fire service occurred in the late 1850s. And as you really look at this, there were fire companies that were formed and disbanded kind of almost as people would uh, change their, their clothing. There, there's things that were formed, they didn't work out. And so really there was a lot of discord, um, some investments that were made, but there really wasn't an efficient organized fire service until you really got into the late 1870s. And then there were a number of change outs of personnel and then Thomas Harding was appointed uh, in 1883. I always, you know, kind of take a bit of a reflection also in, um, in Bay City history. We always kind of think that, you know, today's city commission and political structure at times can be a bit uh, rancorous. Um, when when uh, Chief Harding was appointed, he was appointed by eight to five by the city commission. You would think that that would have, you know, been something that wouldn't have been very uh, controversial. Uh, and even that selection back in 1883 uh, tended to be something that ginned up a little bit of the pro and, and con or pro and anti uh, factions that were there. Um, I guess, you know, the other part here is that our city was really one that was thriving and growing. Um, and one of the things that, that Thomas Harding will be known for when we reflect upon him after his death was he was very concerned about the fact that as our city was growing, right, a lot of that city was built of wood. And so there was a lot of opportunity to be thinking about regulation and planning so that if you did have a fire and you weren't successful in saying keeping it to the building of origin, you weren't wiping out a whole block. And that, you know, again, you can talk about it from a safety standpoint. There's obviously economic repercussions uh, when you start to say, look, you have to build buildings not out of wood, but out of stone and other fire resistive constru uh, construction features. But that played very central because you either had a very small fire or you ended up having very, very large fires. And uh, obviously we, we have a history of, of, of both of those uh, in our area. I would also like to say, and sometimes we don't reflect upon this enough, but Bay City at the time was really an emerging and fairly wealthy city overall. Obviously there was the dichotomy of the people uh, who were well off and those who maybe were a bit more, um, you know, less fortunate who were kind of the laboring class that were there, but the economic condition of the community allowed for significant investments in technology. And, and Bay City was among one of the leaders in the United States in some key technology. So we ended up having a fire alarm telegraph system as early as the 1870s. So, you know, you kind of think about these red fire boxes you'd pull and you'd get a coded signal at a station or at a monitoring location. Uh, we had a system, it was called the Chester Pond Fire Alarm System that was functional in the late 1870s, well before many communities even thought about putting in what today would be called a game well system. We also were early adopters of what is the, called the Holly Fire or Holly Water Municipal Water System. And what the Holly Water System was designed to do is it had pumps that had variable speed drops. And so it was part of providing safe municipal drinking and, and industrial water. But if you started to have a huge demand, as if in a fire, the pumps could get faster and give you more water and more pressure. And so both Bay City, and I have the dates and, and the system numbers, you can see both of them are within the first 100 systems that were installed in the United States, and West Bay City were early adopters. Now the promise of the Holly Water System, and again, I promise I won't go too deep in any one of these areas, was the fact that you could supply then a fire department and they would not need to have pumpers or steamers. They would not need something to pump the water. You would just need wagons and hose reels that could be connected to the hydrants and you could put water on the fire. And anybody who's studied basic uh, hydraulics knows that that works really well until the fire gets really, really big and I use a lot of hoses because no matter what, there's a design basis. And unfortunately we discovered in 1892 during the Great Conflagration that once you start getting like a block involved and you start laying lots of fire hose, the Holly water system did not have sufficient capacity to extinguish the fire. And you know, needless to say, in the 1893, 1894 timeframe, we were starting to buy more steamers, right? We, we kind of went through that, that path. But like many things in the fire service, 
each of these technologies kind of had the, you know, the advocates for change and those who were very concerned and resistant to change. And you know, throughout the fire service history, from going with manual equipment to horse-drawn equipment, horse-drawn equipment to motorized equipment, motorized gasoline power equipment to motorized diesel equipment, there were evolutions that made that firefighting equipment more efficient, safer, but there were transitions and resistance to those changes. And obviously, as we worked on bringing the water system and even bringing the fire alarm telegraph system, these were not necessarily things that were obvious winners when they were first put into play. They took a lot of work, a lot of maintenance, and a lot of integration into the systems that we had. So we're going into the mid-1880s with a very good set of technology, organization of the fire service that was kind of a combination of a few paid people and volunteer individuals to a department that was becoming principally a professional fire force in 1883. And that was when Thomas Harding, the gentleman uh, that's pictured here on the right, um, was uh, put in charge of, as at the time the title was Chief Fire Engineer, that's just a fancy title for Fire Chief uh, in the area. Now, what's interesting about uh, Chief Harding is he first of all was born in Canada and you know emigration from Canada to the US in that time, that's not unusual at all. But his trade was that of a printer and he started then working in the press business in Detroit and came to Bay City and was a, a really a well-respected journalist and printing operator and started to get involved in the fire service when he came into the community in the mid-1860s. So, you know, he was starting to get involved uh, in the fire service at that particular time but stayed active in the printing business until really the time that he was appointed as the fire chief in 1883. Just keep that as somewhat of a memory marker because one of the things, and I brought, if people are interested in taking a look, um, a lot of the history of the department has been collected from what were called annual reports of the chief fire engineer. And some of these are some of the most beautiful printing books I've ever seen before, it, both on the covers and the content. And until I kind of put A and B together of, well, this guy was a printer, right? So this is something that was really important to him. And he was also somebody who was very masterful in understanding the power of the press. Because Bay City, through his tenure, was one that was covered in the, tra the fire trade press nationally, and many of the things that were happening in Bay City were being reflected in fire and water engineering, uh, some of the municipal hydraulic news in other areas. And Bay City was kind of one looked at as a, a thought leader on this particular area. Now, sometimes we might say, ah, I'm not so sure, you know, were we really a thought leader in that area? But Thomas Harding really was a great promoter of this city and really both from the technology of the fire department and really saying, hey, this city has a lot to offer. And for example, when he passed away in 1912, that was covered in really newspapers throughout the, the country. So it was kind of a, a big deal uh, in that particular area. Um, you know, what, what I would just say is that right before his passing in 1912, um, he also had started to set the path of motorized fire apparatus. Now, many departments were starting to go through this debate as early as maybe 1908, 1909. Bay City kind of took a bit more of a, I'm gonna call it a deliberate and rational approach, uh, maintained our horse-drawn equipment through 1911. The first piece of apparatus was actually a combination fire chiefs and chemical tank car uh, that was there. And then in 1912 and 13, we started to get what would be more traditional motorized fire pumpers uh, that were put in place. And those, those pieces of work were put in place by, by Chief Harding. Uh, he did get to see the first one come into service before his passing, but then the rest really happened after he passed away in uh, September of 1912. Now, as with any story um, that you go through, I could spend three hours talking about all the different things that happened under Chief Harding's watch. Um, what I've tried to do here is talk about a couple of the, the major disasters and a couple of the major uh, triumphs that are here. And I, you know, just to kind of give you the, the lay of the pictures, the upper left-hand side is in City Hall. This is where the, uh, basically the, the commissioner, the fire commissioners had an office and the superintendent of the fire alarm had an office. And this is where the fire alarm system would ring in and be monitored. 
so very high technology, but also just a beautiful piece of like Victorian artwork. It's kind of this really, really wonderful mechanical system. And we we're very fortunate that the, uh, the Bay County Historical Museum has the little components that are on that table on the left hand side, including the glass and glazed uh, repeater mechanism. The Fire Museum also today has several of the tapping mechanisms and several of the boxes that were used for that uh, fire alarm system that were on the corners. And so we're hoping to kind of be able to amalgamate that over time. The right upper right hand is the Fraser Hotel fire. We'll talk just briefly about that. Uh, occurred in 1906 and some of the uncanny likenesses to the Winona Hotel and the Winona Hotel fire. Uh, because the Fraser Hotel is located or was located exactly where the Winona Hotel was located, and it went through really the same history of a luxurious hotel. It went into decline, and then a fire occurred. Fortunately, in that fire, there was only one person that that perished, who happened to be the hotel security guard. Uh, when he went to investigate the smoke, he opened up a room, and basically the fire rushed out of the room and, and uh, burned him to where he uh, was mortally wounded. And then the last one is, you know, we, we have a number of pictures, obviously, in the historical collection here, but the conflagration from 1892 on the south end of Bay City that wiped out um, more than 30 blocks. Um, and fortunately, I say fortunately, only killed one resident. Uh, when, you, when you go through that and you start to think about other large cities uh, that went through simpler, similar conflagrations, um, you know, they, they would lose dozens, if not hundreds of people. And we were very fortunate that we only lost one citizen uh, in that fire. I will also just kind of you know mention here as we go through the Gamewell system was the uh, basically the system that moved from the Chester Pond system to the fire alarm system that was put in Bay City that came into service in 1890, and it stayed in service until 1957. So if you think about uh, you know this technology, which was Civil War telegraph technology, um, it lasted and was maintained uh, up through 1957. And the Bay City Times has this wonderful article about retired Gamewell engineers who had to be uh, brought back on contract to make sure they could keep the things working. It, it's just a spectacular uh, message. And then the telephone system really became the backbone, right? The precursor of 911. Um, just want to make sure that, so, you know, one of the big, there were a couple of big fires that occurred on, on, um, on Chief Harding's watch, the Great Conflagration of 1892. Um, and in these annual reports that I mentioned, um, there's masterful prose, right? You know, we, we sometimes think about how uh, people in a political environment try to explain bad things that happen and put the best spin on pot as possible. And the, the colorful um, discussion in the annual report from 1892 explaining how good things went in the fire, obviously some of them have basis in fact, uh, but obviously some of them were, I'll just call them kind of colorful, I think attributes to kind of make people feel a little better about what happened in that area. But you know, basically what happened is we had a fire that occurred in the waterfront, there's a debate of was it a passing tug or was it one of the sawmills, but then high winds really blew it uh, to the east and it was really you know, the combination of some firefighting effort, but basically a shift in wind direction that then pushed the fire back onto the burnt area that had the fire subdued. And that fire burnt those 30 blocks in less than five hours. Um, and again, we were limited with manpower, Bay City, West Bay City, the city of Saginaw, and Flint. Okay? One other thing that came out of the 1892 conflagration is the first fire alarm box that was pulled on that was box number 65. Um, and Box 65 became a benevolent society or a benevolence association that started in the 1930s and 1940s that had a canteen service and also a fundraising arm for some of the benevolent uh, fire societies that were there. So there used to be kind of a Red Cross canteen. It was run by about 100 people under the Box 65 Association. And uh, during the 40s and 50s, there were a number of promotions and pictures of, of apparatus that, that, were, that were supporting uh, the canteen effort. <coughs> In 1905, as you know, we consolidated uh, the, base, uh, the Bay City and West Bay City governments. And as part of that amalgamation, the fire departments were consolidated and Chief Hardy maintained uh, the leadership of the joint fire departments. Uh, that went through some high points and low points, right? Because as you go through amalgamations, there are obviously traditions and lines of authority that uh, ended up having to be modified a slight bit. But ultimately that seemed to be a moderately successful uh, transition 
um, and most of the personnel who were involved in both departments uh, were maintained and, and, and continued on from, from the beginning that was there. Talk just briefly about the Fraser Hotel fire in December of 1906. So the Fraser Hotel, as I mentioned, was basically, you know, it was built, I believe, in 1867, and it was a pretty high-end hotel, essentially at the same location where the Delta Planetarium is today, but where the Winona Hotel ended up by, uh, being built. And uh, it started on fire, fortunately, right before Christmas, so it was not highly occupied. Um, and basically the, the building, as you can see, it, it more or less burnt to the ground. And it was ultimately demolished and two years later, it was built, uh, rebuilt as the Winona Hotel. Again, an opulent leading edge hotel that then up through 1977 kind of went through its decline. And we ultimately had the, um, the Winona Hotel fire also in December of 1977, but earlier. And unfortunately that to this day is the largest single loss of life that we've had in a fire within Bay County in our entire history. Um, so the outcome of that fire was unfortunately a bit, uh, um, a, a bit, you know, more more significant. One of the untold stories in the history here is that during 1906 and 1907, uh, Chief Harding's son Thomas was an employee of the fire department and also was involved with Hook and Ladder Company Number One. And he affected several rescues in this fire that were well accoladed and uh, not quite sure why Thomas elected to leave the department, uh, but he ended up moving down into the Detroit area to do electrical and electrician type of work. But he had a very short tenure, but that tenure uh, was noted uh, with some of his heroics in saving lives uh, in the fire from, uh, from the Fraser uh, Hotel. So the, the, the last part of the story of, of, of Chief Harding is there are a number of things yet to this day um, that have his fingerprints on it. And sometimes we kind of forget about this. Uh, and then I'll kind of mention about really uh, another way that we're forgetting a lot about that. So number one, he had 44 years of service in the Bay City Fire Department from when he first started participating, really af right after moving into the community through then his full-time advocation as the chief fire engineer until he died in 1912. And as part of that, you know, he was, as I said, a huge advocate for what we call fire limits and fire escapes. Um, and so, you know, if you look at some of our older buildings, uh, you still see these steel uh, stairways that are usually counterweighted, right, so that people had a second way out that was maybe not the most luxurious way, but they could get out of a building because he was very, very concerned about large fires and people getting trapped in structures. And, and every year when you read the, the reports of the Bay City Fire Department, he was always pushing for that um, and sometimes getting a lot of pushback from landowners and property owners, uh, but was really central in the early 1900s about getting really kind of a fire code, let's call it that, established within the city of Bay City. Um, he was also the brains and really the, the person who drove the architecture of the central fire station that many of us recall at uh, McKinley and Adams. Uh, as you really think about moving from horse-drawn uh, fire apparatus to motorized apparatus, we were able to consolidate the number of fire stations. And so basically what happened is the old headquarters station near Washington and 3rd Street and the one at, uh, at uh, fire station number three near Columbus and Washington were consolidated into the station that was really in service until the central station now on Center Avenue uh, was put into place. Um, quick side note there, um, about a year ago, we had a family in Saginaw call up uh, the fire museum and uh, m make mention the fact that they had a, a family member who passed on and they had the doorknob from the front of the McKinley and Adams fire station. And you kind of go, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting. But with it, a presentation plaque that came with this. And, and basically what happened is there was a child who lived in a house right next to McKinley and Adams and was kind of like the adopted kid of the fire station. And so he hung out a long time. And when they closed and demolished the building, they gave his family this doorknob with kind of the history of the, the fire station, which is kind of cool. The little piece that I never put together is that the fire chief who opened that fire station, uh, Crampton, Chief Crampton, and his son, Barney Crampton, he opened it, his son closed it. 
And so you had the Crampton father-son duo. And so this is on this presentation plaque that we now have at the Fire Museum in Patterson. And we'll obviously move it to Station 3. But, you know, kind of how a weird doorknob and the history of that uh, really came into be. But uh, Chief Harding was really big about that, that centralization that was there. Um, the thing that I'll mention is the picture, on the, and I'm, I'm trying to kind of do this in a little bit of the background, but the picture on the left is the grave site of uh, Chief Crampton and his wife in Old St. Patrick Cemetery. And unfortunately, we know from the newspaper reports that they had headstones, but I was just going out, this is about two years ago, to try to find them, you know, kind of using find a grave, and here's the section. I mean, we looked at every tombstone in the section. My wife was not being very patient with me on this. Um, and lo and behold, as the, the church has checked, the, the Catholic Diocese has checked their records, the tombstones are gone. Um, and so we're working on a, on a project right now in trying to get funding to get a tombstone that adequately represents and, and demarks really the contribution. It's kind of sad that here's a person that gave so much to the community and you know you walk into that cemetery and there's nothing there's nothing there. Uh, obviously the Catholic uh, the diocese doesn't let just anybody come and say, hey, I want to put a tombstone on your cemetery. I, we need to get and identify some member of the family, which we've identified now in the Detroit area, and are starting to work on getting all of that uh, put together. We'd like to rectify that. On the right-hand side, right towards the end of, of Chief uh, Harding's life, the Detroit News did a very interesting article, and this was after his wife passed away. But basically a bit about his history and the fact that he, his horse, and his dog were kind of all like three old codgers and how, they all, how that all kind of fit into uh, the fire service in Bay City. It's a fascinating article, uh, but also a masterful way in which Chief, uh, uh, Chief Harding was able to use the media to help promote uh, some of the uniquenesses of, of Bay County and Bay City. Uh, and I, I found that to be very, very powerful um, and very, very interesting. So before I go to kind of chapter two, let me, any questions about Chief Harding? Like I said, I could, I, the, the, the guy has just a lot of different and very interesting things, um, but it's somebody, we, there's a beautiful display to him uh, and, and some of his other attributes in the museum here. So there's lots of interesting background. Yes, ma'am. Did he originally have a headstone? Yes, there was a headstone that was there. Um, what the, Now, again, I'm not trying to play a, a forensic scientist here, but in the old St. Patrick Cemetery, the driveways are very narrow, and this plot is right next to the, the uh, driveway. I am guessing sometime in the last 30 or 40 years, there was a snow plow that may have removed or damaged those. Um, I think that happens every winter that was here. Um, and there was nobody locally that was kind of paying attention to the grave. Most of the family has moved to Detroit or out of the area there because the family at the time when I reached them in Detroit, they kind of knew about uh, Chief Harding, but nobody had been up to the grave site. So I think it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, unfortunately. All right, so the second story, and I apologize, um, I gotta get a drink of water, my seasonal allergies are just absolutely killing me here, um, is, is another person who you might know in history, Paul Gloxine, as an automotive dealer um, in, in Bay City, right? So he had a number of enterprises um, that include a car dealership, a Hudson dealership. Um, he was the W.S. Darley fire equipment a representative for mid-Michigan. W.S. Darley was a Chicago, Melrose Park, Illinois, but Chicago, Illinois, uh, manufacturer that still exists today that makes fire pumps, fire trucks, and other firefighting equipment. Um, and ultimately, um, a fire chief, and we'll talk a little bit about how that happened and, and where that came to be, as well as a niche manufacturer of fire apparatus. And you probably coming to today did not, maybe you got a little bit of a teaser with the third Saturday note that you did, most people don't realize that Bay City had a fire truck manufacturer uh, that was in service. And so Paul Gloxine was kind of the, the brains uh, and, and the, the economic might uh, behind that particular operation. Okay, so the picture that I have here is an, a picture of a Darley fire truck on a Chevrolet chassis uh, that was purchased in 1940. And this was part of an operation that supported the needs of Bangor, Hampton, and Portsmouth townships. Because at that time, while there were opportunities to provide protection from the city of Bay City to send a unit out, it was not necessarily something that was very rapid. And so, you know, if your house kind of caught on fire and you were out in the townships, 
Uh, it's what you could kind of grab and, and get out of the house. And then generally things weren't, they, they didn't turn out very, very well. And so those townships were very interested in starting to put together um, a fire service uh, package. And if you look really throughout our county, uh, the city of Auburn and Williams Township, in that same type of time frame in 47, 48, did similar things. So there were these consortiums being formed. Uh, but what Paul Glockstein basically did as a businessman, an entrepreneur, he approached those townships and formed contracts with them to provide basically apparatus and manpower um, his night watchman drove the truck and they had built this elaborate phone tree where when a fire occurred, you know, they'd call two people who would call two more people and get a number of paid on call volunteers who would respond uh, to the site of the emergency and they would use the, the fire truck that was there. And that was in service from mid to late 1940 until the middle part of 1947 where Bangor Township actually bought the equipment for Mr. Glockstein, they formed their own departments, as did Portsmouth and Hampton. So you start to have these formations, like I said, much like the city of Auburn and Williams Township in the late 1940s. And he was somewhat of the catalyst uh, for how that, that, that operation uh, came into play. Just a very, very interesting um, in, in that, that particular area. I also just found it kind of unique that they'd use a night watchman as kind of the apparatus operator. And uh, then they, you know, again, the kind of the precursor we were talking before the meeting here about, you know, how notifications were made in the old Auburn Williams Township Fire Department. And before we had radio pagers, there were phone trees and, you know, phone calls that were made to let people know there was an emergency as well as a siren system. Okay. So, at the, you know, basically in 1947, uh, Paul uh, was kind of back to being a, a, an automotive dealer, but he also ended up picking up the Willys distributor, uh, distribution uh, body for the Greater Bay City area. And, you know, again, just to kind of level set everybody, Willys was one of the manufacturers of Jeeps for the U.S. Army during World War II. And so, you know, the Willys brand uh, was well recognized as kind of like the, the modern all-terrain vehicle. And so what Mr. Uh, Glockstein basically did is he built prefabricated fire trucks that would put up, sorry, that would put basically a pump on the front of the truck. It would outfit the cabinets on the back of the chassis with places to store hose and other firefighting equipment. And would basically take a Willys truck and convert it into an all-terrain vehicle fire truck. Um, and that was kind of the, their niche and they put these nice manufacturing plates on it. Um, most of the trucks that were made had WS Darley pumps, and the, the reason for that is because it was the WS Darley dealer. And really throughout the life cycle of the enterprise, there were about 100 fire trucks made in the history of the, of the Valley Fire Engine Company, maybe 110. The records of the company have not been well preserved uh, in this particular area. Um, there was also, and I have a picture on the next page, uh, Willys came forward with what's called the FC or forward cab design, uh, and that provided kind of a new way uh, to look at this. So most of the, uh, the trucks that you see that are Valley fire engines are kind of like this low nose with a pump on the front. I'll show, well, I'll preview this and go back. The upper right hand side is what one of those forward cab designs looked like. Um, and, and really kind of the niche that it was filling, we'll, we'll come back to this, was if you had a need to have some firefighting water in a rough terrain to get to, or like an industrial setting where there were lots of sharp turns and corners, this was kind of a truck that was very, very attractive uh, in this area. To the best of our knowledge today, the last survey that was done on owners or secondary owners of these Valley Fire Engines was done in 2002 by the Society for the Preservation and Appreciation of Automotive Antique Fire Apparatus, long name of a, of a group. They had tracked down about 35 of these trucks that were still being used. Now that could be somebody bought it as kind of an antique vehicle, uh, but some were still being used as kind of reserve apparatus in the firefighting uh, business in like uh, national parks. <laughs> where these were, were put into place. So this is one that from a, a museum perspective, we're trying to identify 
um, a truck that we can work on restoring uh, that has this background. So, you know, if anybody knows of a person who has a Valley fire truck hidden in their garage or in their barn, I'd love you to help point them out. We have identified a couple of folks who have them. Several have done restorations and want to keep them for their antique area. Uh, we're willing to do the work. Uh, it's just the, the, the area there we need to kind of uh, uh, try to identify one that at least is salvageable because obviously some of them uh, don't necessarily uh, fit that area. So just a couple of pictures. Pittsburgh plate and glass. That was kind of an industrial park on the right bottom right hand side. City of Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania had a very old part of their city that had very narrow streets. And so this forward cab design was to get firefighting capability that could get down streets if there were cars parked on it. So kind of dealt with very narrow alleyways and streets. And one that I know still exists in Michigan, in this particular area, that's kind of a base of what uh, the Valley Fire Engine uh, Fire Truck Company was making. Willie's chassis, Darley pump on the front. Unfortunately, that picture is from about 15 years ago, and I've recently seen that truck, and it was in a little poorer condition uh, than what it looked like there. That one had some potential, I think. Unfortunately, uh, it may not necessarily have great potential, uh, but it is one that we're trying to get more details on as we go from there. But again, um, about 100 to 125 trucks, very well respected, have kind of a, a niche following in this area, all really going back to uh, Paul Glockstein and the work that he did right after World War II in this area. And in my last chapter of, of this story, I guess before we open it up for, for general conversation, is the work that we're doing on uh, fire station number three. Um, so fire station number three is really this group of fire stations, and you can kind of see the little background here of the six fire stations that represent at Bay City at the turn of the century. And right now there's two of those that still stand today, fire station number three near the corner of Columbus and Washington, and the, I call it the old, it wasn't the original, but the old headquarters building, which is right next to the State Theater. Um, and, and unfortunately that, you know, if you look up at the one uh, by fire station number three near Columbus and, uh, and Washington, you say, hmm, I can kind of see images of the fire station. Uh, the one that's right next to the, uh, the, the State Theater, um, you would have to really have a vivid imagination because the front has been tiled and stuccoed and all kinds of interesting things. But the building is the original building that was built in 1883. Just by way of history, the original fire station and headquarters station was actually part of Old City Hall um, on Saginaw Street, uh, and there was a steamer and a hose wagon that were, were kept there, and it moved to the location that was uh, fire station number one uh, in 1883. So it was originally opened in 1890. It housed a hose company, hose company number three, a hook and ladder company, hook and ladder company number one, a reserve steamer and a chief's buggy. So when I talk about the fact that you look at this building, it's not very wide, but it's really deep. And so there, there's a lot of square feet in this building. It totals about 7,500 square feet on three stories. Now, what's interesting about this is it would house 12 men. Now, you know, the fire department schedules at that time were not like today where you were on for a day and then off for two days. You basically were on all the time and then you would get limited amount of time away. So you basically more or less lived at the fire station. And so it basically had a complement of 12 people that lived there, including two captains as the officers that were there. The first story held the apparatus and a watch desk. The second story on the front facing Washington were basically offices and living quarters. And the back part is where the hayloft was. Everybody kind of thinks the hayloft of the building was on the top floor. What the top floor was reserved for was for a gazillion, um, um, probably five or 600 glass jars that held lead acid for the battery backup for the fire alarm system. And that coincides, right? The building was built in 1890. The fire alarm system was put into service in 1890 and they needed a battery backup. So if power was lost, they had the ability to maintain the fire alarm telegraph system and power outages. Now in retrospect, now first of all, um, and of course I, I thought about this this morning, the I was gonna show you the beauty and I, maybe when we're done, I'll just bring it up because I have the picture. But the third story of this building is beautiful. It's all hand-hewn open, open architecture beams, right? Because there was really no 
functional purpose or or a, a, a you know purpose to impress anybody. It was to store all these jars that were battery backup. But from a workmanship standpoint in the history of Bay City as a lumbering town. Oh, the, the upstairs is just beautiful. And of course, as we redo this, the building and the fire codes are really kind of uh, a little bit uh, freaky about having all this exposed wood. So there's some things we're gonna have to do to uh, curtail a little bit of that. But the third story was, you know, again, storing all this acid and you kind of go, geez, everybody's living below that. What happens if, you know, something falls over and, and but there are no reports uh, that we ever had any of those, uh, those accidents. And that stayed in service until 19, uh, 1917. So we acquired this building and, you know, again, it was, it stopped being a fire station in 1917. So for 102 years, it had a purpose other than being a fire station. And I would just say that for those 100 years of service, which included a carpentry shop, a clothing shop, we were talking about, I guess you could get varsity jackets and, and uh, engraving there. Uh, and then the Veterans, um, uh, the Veterans Association in the county used it as a secondhand store. For those 102 years, the building has really kind of w withstood that use uh, quite well and so you know we have taken some of the attachments that were put onto that building off of the building uh, unfortunately right there's some scars in the front which we'll be working on this summer to uh, pretty those up so it starts to look like the front of a fire station but structurally the walls and the foundation are doing quite well now as we go into making it a museum and thinking about heating ventilation uh, access for uh, handicapped individuals the life safety systems like sprinklers. There's a lot of infrastructure work that has to go that just wasn't there in 1890. But that work is uh, underway in what we're doing. What we're ultimately going to do is use all three stories with an elevator to allow us to get up there. Apparatus on the ground floor, which will hold eight to 10 pieces of apparatus. And our museum will continue to work on rotating the, the, the designs, uh, the trucks that we have. Uh, because really starting in COVID uh, times, we have now gotten 14 of our apparatus that we can run and drive on the road. And so we're working on trying to build that inventory so we can demonstrate how some of these pieces of apparatus worked uh, in the times that they had there. Um, and then um, we will continue to use our Patterson Road facility, first of all, for maintenance and archival storage, but we have people who are researching some of the pieces of apparatus in our collection, and um, they, they really want to look at a specific apparatus, whether or not it's on display, and so we're able to, you know, do that and operate it and do those things, whether or not it's in the museum location. So um, I'll just kind of walk as we maybe now open up for questions. Uh, hopefully you all know that the museum is currently operated. It's sometimes Bay City's or Bay County's best kept secret, which that's not a good thing. Um, we're located at 3456 Patterson Road. We are open weekends starting the first weekend in May through the end of October. We have about 60 pieces, 60 of motorized apparatus. Um, and also a number of hand and horse drawn pieces of apparatus. Our earliest piece comes from 1854 from the city of Saginaw and our most modern one is from 1993 from the city of Bay City. And we really run the, the gamut from there. And with one notable exception that I'll mention in a minute, all of those pieces of apparatus focus on pieces of equipment that would have been used in normal everyday cities for normal everyday purposes. So we really want to try to bring the experience to someone on how normal fire apparatus that would have been in your neighborhood would have worked, functioned, what it would have looked like. Uh, and we maintain them in a safe enough condition, not in a museum pristine condition. And if somebody wants to sit on a seat and get a picture, we, you know, obviously with a little bit of constraint, uh, we work on allowing that to happen. So we're kind of very much a touch museum in this area. We have to be careful, right? Because I mean, they are motorized uh, pieces of equipment. And we also do on several pieces of our equipment offer rides after you complete the tour. So we have like a 1946 REO speed wagon that has bench seating that came from the city of Midland. We'll go out for about an hour, uh, about a mile and a half ride uh, to give you kind of a little bit of a perch in the greater Patterson Road, Wilder Road area in, in, in providing that. Um, I said that we have really one piece of equipment, one piece of apparatus that doesn't fit that mold of our collection strategy of normal everyday apparatus. And we were, blessed, let me just put it that way, with the opportunity to acquire the city of New York's super pumper when it went out of service uh, in the mid-1980s. 
And this is, at the time, the world's largest pumper. It's still to this day. There has not been an individual piece of fire apparatus that has been as large or as uh, have capacity of, of this, this particular truck. Now, we could have a debate. Is that because this was not necessarily a really wise design? There are people who believe that, that it was so big it was very impractical. Um, but this basically is a fireboat on wheels. And so, you know, one of the things we can talk about the history of Bay City and fireboats and Defoe and fireboats, you know, this kind of is a nice anchor leg to that because it's a fireboat on wheels uh, in what we do. Uh, and this is an area where our mechanics are now really, we've been working particularly because the engine, the diesel engine on this is a European design. It's called a Napier Deltic. Uh, we've been working with several groups that have preserved and, and restored engines uh, from that European theater, and they've been giving us a lot of guidance as we're working on scoping this. Our ultimate goal over time is that during the Bay City Fireworks Festival, we could actually go down and before you'd light the fireworks, we could fire this thing up and pump 7,700 gallons a minute of water, you know, kind of across the Saginaw River is kind of a way to open this up. That would be, or during a tall ship celebration to really have that. And if we were able to do that, we'd have disciples from around the world who would be coming because this truck is exceptionally popular by people who are interested in, in the fire service history. We've been working, this, this is an example of the Essexville uh, Fire Department. This is um, a 1928 American LaFrance truck on a, on a Buick chassis. We acquired this, this happened to be the first piece of apparatus that entered the museum collection really in the early 1960s. That truck had not run for nearly 40 years. And during the COVID timeframe, our volunteers got together and we now routinely take this out. You've seen Essexville has driven it in the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade. We take it to the Frankie Muth muster and it both runs and pumps. Um, and it was kind of a miraculous labor of love. Uh, some of these things are a little easier than others, but they were able, our group of volunteers was able to get this. So number one, it ran better, uh, well, it ran, now it runs and it pumps uh, very, very well. There are a lot of ways if you're interested in any aspect of the fire service history that we're working on trying to preserve with the museum, there's a lot of different ways that people can help. And whether that's helping us with artifacts, with stories, with history. If you have somebody in your family that loves mechanics, wants to help us with tour guides, wants to help us with some of the other promotions, I have a place within the family of the museum to do that. We have people who volunteer locally, and we have people who volunteer remotely. And so like the people who manage our webpage and our Facebook page don't even live in the mid-Michigan area. They live in Indiana, but they're excited uh, with our mission and are helping us here. Uh, obviously, there's lots of ways here, uh, but the most important thing, if you could do me the biggest favor, tell two or three of your neighbors about the mission of this museum, that we exist, that we're open, and it's kind of fun. Once you come the first time, it's addictive. If, I can, if you get in the front door, I, I think you'll find that it's a really kind of an exciting time. So we do have a very active web page and Facebook page. Feel free to look at those. And with that, let me open up the floor. If you know, And I can go back, like I said, we can bring some pictures out. Uh, on the front picture, I actually did have, that was a Bay City fireboat, which we don't recognize. Uh, there, was, there were Bay City fireboats during the lumbering era uh, that were patrolling uh, the Saginaw River. That was kind of the little bit of the teaser I had in the opening slide. But any questions you have or stories that you know that you'd like to share, I'd, I'd love to hear from them or hear about them. Uh, 85 Tuscola Road. So Gopher Turf and Toe is there, and I think there's another lawn and equipment business that's located uh, there. So really between Columbus and, what is that, Cass yeah. uh, Avenue there on the, uh, on the east side of the road. The, the question really is about kind of a rollout and timing. So we have all of the architecture and engineering drawings for the project completed. We have an estimate. We're still now in an active phase of fundraising. We're not yet to where we can launch the whole project. We will be doing a significant work on the facade side of the building this summer to start getting it to fit better into the decor of the area. And as we go, we may go further as we, we go into there. The condition of the building is in good enough condition that we can do kind of a phased opening. So for example, we could bring some of the apparatus and some of the firefighting artifacts and open it up for special events and other activities. And that's how we may end up rolling this out for public events and special uh, uh, events that, that we can work through there. In a perfect world, I'd love to have it all done 
I have to be a we're going to then coordinate that we will and we continue and invest in the Patterson Road facility both as an archival facility and as a maintenance uh, facility for our trucks. We host a number of bus tours of people who just want to that experience and we'll be able to offer either one of those. So, you know, we will have opportunities as we get to the end of the summer and into the fall. You know, fire prevention week in early October is kind of a natural time for us to do this linkage. We're also hoping, you know, I was kind of doing a little bit of a soft sell about this effort with uh, Chief Harding and his wife's tombstone. Uh, he passed away in September of 1912. We'd like to try to memorialize that that week or month that he died. So we may have some other activities that would link uh, well into there. I also, I don't have any good murder mysteries or haunted sightings in the fire museum. I know that would get us extra points. Haven't discovered that yet. I, there was a question in the back. I'll come right to you, sir. Go ahead. All of our events and all of our schedule are both on our Facebook and web page, but starting the first week in May, Saturday and Sunday, noon to four. Um, and if you just send us an email or give us a call, um, we accommodate family tours and other tours that don't fit that time schedule. What we're, you know, what we're trying to do is have a baseline set of hours that people know are predictable and we'll have docents there. Uh, but we also accommodate all kinds of group tours, bus tours and others really by schedule. Uh, and, and you know we, we try to make that uh, you know try to make that as flexible for people as we can. Okay, now I I don't have things other than some little notes when there were really big fires and like an engine would be dispatched out. I don't think there was a lot of support. And, and the reason I'd say that, let me give you the analogy. Uh, in Auburn, Williams Township, where I was a, a firefighter and fire chief, Freeland had a fire department that ran, and that would on occasion be dispatched if we had a large house fire. Well, by the time apparatus from Freeland would show up in parts of Williams Township, uh, you know, you basically had a foundation left to say, I mean, not trying to be uh, light about this, you know, time, time and location, it just never worked very well. And I think the same kind of problems arose there. So I think if there was somebody trapped, if there was a large fire, there would be dispatching uh, that would occur there. Now, if you just quickly, if you go way back in time, you know, early in the, in the uh, formation of Bay City, Portsmouth was kind of a district and it was really brought in. So Portsmouth early had a steam fire engine before all of the Bay City amalgamation occurred. And when that occurred, that steamer came into the city of Bay City um, as you know, it's kind of like the Portsmouth district. Similar like when West Bay City, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna botch this one, but you basically had Banks, Winona, and was it Salzburg? They were three districts. And in 1877, they were amalgamated into West Bay City. So Portsmouth kind of had a fire department, then it didn't, right, as, as the township developed. But I think it was very informal. And I would just say that, that again, I'm, I'm making a bit of an assumption, that there was a willingness to help if there was true life safety or life hazard that was there. But I think otherwise, it was probably a bit slow and bureaucratic. Let, let, let me kind of maybe start with a, a high-level architecture question because you ask a, you ask a good question. So, a fire truck really has it can have one of three main purposes. One is it can pump water. The second, it can carry hose, and the third is it can carry ladders, right? And so, you know, we ha we have specialized names: hose wagon, pumper, aerial device. And over the years, those nomenclatures have continued to morph. So, a fire truck unless you have more details could be it could have all three of those right i mean we have trucks that we call quintrup a quintuple uh fire pieces of apparatus where you have the ladder you have the hose wagon you have a pump and then some other functionality that's that's put on the truck where you're kind of packaging those all together early on before we had a and bay city kind of went through this a little bit uh, but Bay City had a pretty good municipal water supply early in this process, but a lot of communities did not. And so what they would do is they would outfit pieces of apparatus with what were called chemical tanks. 
and it would be 35 or 40 gallon pressure vessels that you would mix acid and so basically sodium bicarbonate and sulfuric acid. It would generate pressure and push that water out of small hose and you might have two of those tanks on a piece of apparatus. They would be called chemical engines or chemical wagons. Um, we have just, I say just, we've had it now for two years. Uh, a family in Petoskey, Michigan, gave us a 1926 REO Speedwagon that has two of those soda acid tanks, and we've restored that. It now runs. Uh, that'll be kind of on the parade circuit this summer. But they're artistically beautiful uh, because they have all this hammered uh, kind of uh, uh, or, uh, uh, chrome plated uh, end heads and all of that. It's really kind of beautiful. So the fire engine really was, you know, that term really came when things became motorized. Well, before that, you could have a pumper that was a steam fired one that was horse drawn and would typically be called a steam fire engine or a steamer. And then you have hand pumpers. Yeah, somebody's mentioning hand pumpers. Right, I mean, hand pumping from the area of the Revolutionary War really through up to the Civil War when you really then started to bring steam fire engines uh, more commonly into practice. You know, Really, on behalf of, of the board of the Fire Museum, thank you for the opportunity to, to chat today. I'm going to stay here if there's other questions or you want to see some of these uh, fascinating uh, annual reports uh, from the, from the, uh, the fire department. Um, I, you know, again, what I would just say is, uh, you know, if you can share with your neighbors, if you ever become aware of somebody who has a piece of Bay City fire history, um, even for us to just get information about it, I'm not saying that it gets donated to the museum. We've had a lot of families over the last two or three years bring some very, very interesting, you know, archival information that we've been able to, in some cases, preserve, in other cases, really just kind of copy and document. But that's really part of allowing me and other members of our team to give you a much more robust and accurate fire history background. So, you know, keep that in mind uh, as you're meeting with neighbors, friends, uh, and family. Well, we will always entertain donations to you know, the large apparatus as well as the toy collection. What we try to do with the toys is take a look at what somebody has, evaluate what we have in the collection. If it's a duplicate, we'll, you know, we'll be very transparent that there may be a different way uh, that you can get value or participation there. Or if this, the, the object that somebody's bringing is a better quality one, we have to be careful, right, in the standpoint here of, you know, we take something into the collection, you now inherit a responsibility to kind of maintain and curate that object. So not that we're picky, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but we will go through a rationalization uh, to make sure that uh, we, we've taken that uh, on board. Um, you know, the last thing, we, we want to preserve this, number one, is a, a tourist attraction, number two, kind of a historical repository, but also something that will bring families and other folks, you know, into downtown, uh, that they can do that. So, you know, if I can get more relevant examples of some of these toys, it, it absolutely is in our interest to, to have a conversation. Uh, and, and again, each community is a little bit different. They have a model that's a public safety model, so very similar to the base city model, um, where you have a, a, a core but very small group of people who are the fire professionals or the firefighters, and then the law enforcement officers or public safety officers that can serve either side. They, are bo they both respond to law enforcement pieces, but in a fire, they're certified and trained firefighters. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, when Bay City went through this, it was a very controversial uh, transition. Um, you know, again, I think it has at least shown on the surface to have some benefits. There are models of this throughout the country, uh, but there are obviously the traditional model is kind of a fire department and a police department in an emergency. They have different defined roles and responsibilities, um, but there's pros and cons, right, in that model. I, I can't say that there's... more stress on my Bay City then? Well, so... What, what happens is I would say um, it forces us to be more open to what we call mutual assistance. Um, and I, I'm originally from the East Coast of Pennsylvania, and we're, you know, we have this tradition of, you know, short of a meteor hitting your, your community, you never called for help because that was a sign of weakness. And the reality is, okay, in the fire service, we're stressed for manpower, <clears throat> we're stressed for volunteers in the volunteer departments. We have to get much more 
mature, much more advanced in being able to use mutual aid. I will say that Bay County has been really kind of a leader in this area. And so if you do have a large fire in Bay City or in the townships, uh, there's a lot of cooperative mutual assistance that's there and it's called early. Right, because the faster you can get there, the more manpower and the more firepower you can bring. You're going to put the fire out quicker, and if somebody's trapped, minutes make a difference. So um, there's a system called MABIS, which is Michigan, let's see, I'm sorry, Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, but the Michigan version of MABIS, Mutual Alarm, or Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, where we've mapped out and pre-planned what those mutual aid calls would be. So, um, and so in the standpoint that, you know, you have a house fire and it's the day and you have limited resource, you say, I need the second alarm or I need the third alarm. And you get automatic calls that are made to the neighboring department. So yeah, we're, we're in a lot better shape. There are places in this country still that are, I'll call them in this dark age way that, you know, calling for help is still viewed as a, a weakness. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm here. If there's other individual questions, I will dig up that picture. We'll, we'll try to kind of just put up here for everybody of the uh, third story, the hand-hued beams in from there. But uh, thanks again for your interest and uh, for giving up a little bit of your uh, nice, warm day.